This is an oxidation reduction balancing problem. Let's go over it to see how we can solve it. We've got potassium dichromate crystals, which provide us the dichromate polyatomic ion, and in an acidic solution, it reacts with this double acid, oxalic acid, to change into a chromium ion, chromium-3, water and carbon dioxide. Now, compounds are interesting, so it's like a quick diversion. Of course, you can't have just dichromate ions. Typically, you'll have something like potassium dichromate. Here you can see K2Cr2O7. It's a beautiful, brilliant orange. It's a rather dangerous substance in terms of toxicity. The dichromate is used quite often industrially as an ion for leather tanning. Three quarters of all leather has to be treated in some way to make it tougher and so it doesn't soak up water. And the dichromate ion is used to do that. Here you can see somebody dumping in a bunch of dichromate into a bin where they've got some hides to start the tanning process. They try and rinse off all the dichromate and there's limits in terms of down to three parts per million to end up having chromate or chromium ions in leather. Here's the other version of it chromium-3, in this case we've got a chloride, and it's interesting in terms of color. When it's anhydrous, in other words, it doesn't have any water molecules bonded to it, it's this brilliant purple, but as soon as you add some water around these chromium-3 ions, they turn into this brilliant green. This is also oxalic acid is a well-known double acid. You've got a FA molecule, two carbons, and you have an acid on one side, a COOH, and an acid on the other. So this is unusual to have a organic compound with just two hydrogens and oxygens all over the place. It's found in a lot of plants. In fact, its name comes from the plant group that has a good deal of oxalic acid in it. Maybe the most notorious plant for oxalic acid are rhubarb leaves. The main reason it's toxic is because it binds up calcium and makes a precipitate. So let's go back to this equation and see if we can do some balancing. Our first step in balancing an oxidation reduction reaction, a reaction where electrons are switched back and forth, is to come up with the oxidation number for the elements that are in the reaction that you want to balance. In this case, we can look and see there's quite a few here, but we can ignore some. One of the tricks in some of these problems is to say, you know, what don't I have to do? Well, I notice here we've got H plus, and that is hydrogen with a plus one oxidation number. And we notice it here in water, it's plus one. The only way hydrogen changes its oxidation number is if it turns into a gas, or if it's combined with an alkali metal to make a hydride, which is very unusual. So we can ignore the hydrogens pretty much in terms of oxidation numbers. Also, I see the oxygen is in the compound form, not the elemental form. So we know we're not going to have to deal with that very often. So, you know, what's going to end up changing in terms of oxidation numbers? Well, our transition metals are notorious for that. Here we've got a chromium, and here we've got a chromium. Also, carbon's notorious for changing its oxidation number. In fact, the term oxidation, when you think of burning things, you usually think of carbon turning into carbon dioxide. So that's what we're going to focus on. Let's look and see if we can identify the oxidation number of chromium. Well, to do that, we're going to have to use what we know, and what we know is oxygen. We know that oxygen has an oxidation number of negative 2. Now, we don't know what the oxidation number of chromium is because it can vary. But we'll use that oxidation number of negative 2 for a single oxygen to find out about the chromate. We're going to use what we know to find what we don't know. This dichromate has a charge of negative 2. But we have a negative 2 and 7 oxygens. So we have 7 negative 2s, and that's going to be a negative 14. And the next thing to know is that the elements will add up to their charge. In this case, we've got the dichromate polyatomic ion with a charge of negative 2 that's given. So we know the chromium is going to have to add up with the negative 14 to become a negative 2. So we use a little bit of elementary math and say the dichromate must have an oxidation number of plus 12. 
and there's two of them, so each one would have an oxidation number of plus six. In terms of oxidation numbers, you want to put the individual oxidation number at the top. So we would like to know the oxidation number of each single chromium, each single oxygen. And then we use these subscripts to find out our total numbers and balance everything else. Now, like I said, I think we can ignore the hydrogen here because it doesn't change. The hydrogen here doesn't change either, but the carbon, uh, that's notorious for changing. Let's see. We know oxygen, unless it's a peroxide, and that's always identified. That's the negative two. So we're good with that. There are four negative twos, so we've got ourselves a negative eight. Now, hydrogen, as I said before, is always going to be a plus one unless you have an element or it's a hydride. And we have two hydrogens, so those two hydrogens are going to be plus two. Now, this is a neutral molecule, oxalic acid. We're not dealing with the oxalate polyatomic ion. So we know our total that we have to add up to is going to be zero. Huh? Not difficult math there. Our two carbons have got to be a plus six. But again, be careful. There are two carbons, so each carbon must be a plus three. So we've got our carbon, and we've seen what its oxidation number is. Now let's go and see how our chromate has fared on the other side of the reaction. Well, here it is. It's a plus three. That's going to be easy because we know that the ion has to total up to plus three, and there's only one of them. So the chromium has a plus three, and this is key. We say, hey, here's a change in oxidation number. We go from a plus six to a plus three. We're moving down the number line, which means we have are having reduction. So we must have some oxidation. Well, hydrogen didn't change. It was plus one and oxygen here. We didn't make any peroxides or elements, so it's got to be here in our carbon. But let's see what our oxygen is. Well, we know our oxygen is going to be negative two just like before. And using our logic, we'd say there's a total of negative four for the oxygen. Therefore, if we're going to add up to, if we're going to add up to zero, we know that this carbon must be a plus four. There's only one of them. And let's look at the carbon. We will go from a plus three to a plus four. That number went up. And if the oxidation number increases, we have oxidation. If the oxidation number goes down, we have reduction. So we've identified all the important parts of this reaction in terms of oxidation and reduction. We see that the chromium is reducing and the carbon is oxidizing. The two halves that we always have for an oxidation and reduction reaction. We're going to look at these two half reactions. That's a nice thing about oxidation and reduction. You only have to worry about two things that are happening. Then oxidation and reduction. Now let's make sense of this. We go from a plus six to a plus three. Now oxidation reduction involves electrons. We will know that we have to dump some electrons in here to get rid of this plus charge. And that's the plus three electrons. In other words, we're adding three electrons to this plus six that makes it a plus three. Notice our charges. Plus six minus three equals plus three. So this is our reduction, and reduction is the gain of electrons. So let's look at our carbon now. Our carbon goes from a plus three to a plus four, but we know automatically this must be the oxidation. That means the electron has to be on this side, and this is always true when we have oxidation, which is the loss of electrons. Our good old Leo goes grr. So we've identified the two half reactions, one where the chromate grabs electrons to become chromium-3. The carbon has to get rid of an electron to become plus 4. So the minus 1 and the plus 4, our equation is balanced. We could have put an equation sign here for this. We know for every oxidation there must be a reduction. For every reduction there must be an oxidation. The next step is to balance because you just can't have three electrons being soaked up when there's only one being given. I mean, where did they get the electron? Our next step is to decide how we can end up getting our electrons lost, oxidized, and our electrons gained, reduced. And this is where we multiply the entire equation. 
Well, we only have one electron here, so pretty obviously if we multiply that by three, we get three carbons and three electrons. These carbons will lose three electrons. They'll be removed. The chromium has got this pull on them and pulls them in, and that, that's where this energy for this reaction occur, comes from, and that the chromium picks up those three electrons. Therefore, in this reaction, for every one chromium, there are three carbons. So this set of multiplications are set up so that you always have the same number of electrons. So that we multiply across three electrons and three electrons. Sometimes you have to get fancy because you only have whole numbers of electrons, typically. You know, it is possible to have a fractional oxidation number, but there's never been one on the AP exam. But we're going to use that as the basis for balancing the reaction. Now, we can. We know that for every one chromium, three carbons. So I look at my reaction. This is a difficult one because we start with a dichromate. We start with two chromiums. Well, we can't help that, so we know we've got two chromiums. That part looks good. But I said you have to have three times more carbon than you've got chromium. Well, if we've got two chromiums, three times more carbon would end up making... 3 oxalic acid. 3 times 2 is 6. 3 times more than this 2. And of course, if you have 6 carbons here, we have 6 carbons there. And again, look, 2 times 3 gives us 3 CO2s. We've come up with the key numbers in balancing this reaction. As far as AP is concerned, this is what they look for. They look for to see if you can identify an oxidation reduction reaction where these numbers change. These numbers don't change in an acid base reaction because that's just protons going back and forth. But in this case, we've got electrons being swapped. In colleges, they'll often ask you to balance the rest of the reaction. And they might do that for this because they'll say, hey, do you know about balancing charges? Now, we already know that we've got a three here. And we know that we've got a 6 and a 2. Uh, the rest, conservation of atoms. This involves a little bit of multipl multiplying. And I think one of the reasons you don't see these often on the AP exam is because it just takes a bit too long. Now, we could do it by looking at the oxygens. But I'm going to save the oxygens for last. I know what I'm going to do. Look, we've got a plus 6 on this side. And we have a negative 2 here. Now, I can balance the charges because the reactions have got to be balanced. We have a plus 3, and the only charge here is the dichromate, which has a negative 2, and the hydrogens. So I'm going to have to have the hydrogens so they, when they add to this negative 2, they'll produce a plus 6, 8. Let me double check that. Plus 8 and a negative 2 produces a plus 6, and we have two 3 pluses here plus 6. So our charges are now balanced. And therefore, we can see that our hydrogens are all taken care of. We have, let's see, hydrogen here, we've got 8 plus 6. That's 14. So, ah, that's how we get 14 hydrogens. And now everything's balanced. We've got our hydrogen at work. You can check the oxygens, but that's got to be, you know, 6 plus 2 is, 6 times 2 is 12 plus 7, 19. Let's see if we have 19 oxygens here. 7 plus 3 times 2 is 12, 19. Our oxygens balance. We've got a beautifully balanced reaction. So you've balanced the first redox balancing equation of our assignment. You can use the same procedure for all the rest.